Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, today is a continuation of our Black History Month celebration. And uh, so far, we've been having great events, and I think we've gotten feedback. It's a lot of people really um, appreciative of the events. Um, for today, um, we're talking about redevelopment, race, and the Western edition. And um, in collaboration with the Inspecting Our Foundation series, uh, we have co-hosts Patrick Rivera and Jamoke at Kin Taylor um, talking with uh, Chuck Collins and Mickey Imura on this topic. Now a little bit about um, our speakers. Charles Collins is a San Francisco native and was born in 1947 to parents who lived in the Fillmore community. Collins has served in leadership capacities as president and chairman of WDG Ventures Incorporated, a real estate development firm in San Francisco, a president and chief executive officer of the Family Service Agency of San Francisco, and president and chief executive officer of the YMCA of San Francisco. In his work with YMCA, Collins has supported its mission to strengthen the foundations of communities through youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. And uh, thanks so much, Charles, for joining us today. Also, we have Mickey Imura. Uh, Mickey Imura was born in Kobe, Japan in 1948. His family moved to New York County when he was seven, and he grew up there. He came to California in 1967 to go to college. He graduated from University of Pacific. His first job was in Japantown, and he has lived here since 1971. His political activism started in 1972 with the anti-war movement. From 1973, on, he was active in the committee against Nihon Machi evictions, also acronym K, which was a mass organization that struggled against redevelopment. Uh, Kane became the Japanese Community Progressive Alliance, JCPA, and most of the work was on the redress and reparations that Japanese Americans sought justice for their incarceration in concentration camps during World War II. He retired in 2010 after 20 years as a UPS driver. So yeah, we're really glad to have both Mickey and Charles join us, but also I wanna take this moment to welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick. Thanks, Bayor. Welcome everyone to the second in a series of Inspecting Our Foundation, a re-examination of public works history through a racial equity lens. For folks not familiar with Inspecting Our Foundation, we'll share a link in the chat on um, the, what's Inspecting Our Foundation. So last month, we had a presentation and discussion on indigenous perspectives on land and water with Dr. Jonathan Cordero. Today, as Bayor said, in partnership with Black History Month, we're presenting a conversation about redevelopment race and the Western edition with Chuck and Mickey. Uh, just to give uh, a little background on public, public works role in, in redevelopment, um, back in 1954, uh, Public Works established a department condemnation program, which was created to restore unsafe buildings to meet requirements of the codes or demolish them. Initially, the department condemnation program was empowered to inspect all buildings in the redevelopment designated areas except occupied hotels and apartment houses, which were to be inspected only where structural or safety conditions were concerned. The department condemnation program was extremely active. By the end of the 1957 fiscal year, they had investigated over 1,100 cases throughout the city's redevelopment area resulting in the demolition of 400 buildings and the restoration of an additional 300 buildings. Um, so just a little bit of background on our role. 
Um, before we hear from Chuck and Mickey, we're going to show 10 minutes of um, the Fillmore, uh, which is uh, Peter Stein film. Um, it's actually a one hour long film. And uh, Peter Stein has generously offered uh, our staff to uh, view the film uh, for the month uh, of February, for the remaining month of February. Uh, there's uh, there'll be a link and a password for you to to view the film. I watched the film. I thought it was great, and I would encourage you to watch as well. It provides a great history of um, the Fillmore. Um, and with that, we will be showing. Um, um, a brief 10 minute snippet of, of the Fillmore before we have our discussion with Chuck and Mickey. People can. Is anyone else having a sound problem? We're, I can't. We're, we're not, whoever's presenting or sharing your screen, we're not getting sound. So we'll need to start from the beginning. Yeah, you might need to reload the screen. Yes. Because it popped up briefly and then it went, it went out. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. apologies for that. Hold on one second. Thank you for your patience. Let's see. Yes, I'm now. Um, we could hear the sound. Okay. You're right there. Is it working now? Yes. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank we'll you. We'll start in five seconds. People can't agree on much about this place, even what to call it. The Fillmore. The Western Edition. The Fillmore. The Lower Pacific Heights. Japan Town. J Town. New Homachi. The Western Edition. The Western Edition of the Fillmore. Just plain old Fillmore, okay? It's the muddle in the middle, a four square mile level patch just west of downtown. That's what earned it its original name, the Western Edition. But if there's one thing people do agree on, it's that for nearly 40 years, this neighborhood was San Francisco's little United Nations. Not by design, but by an act of God. The great earthquake of April 1906 left the city in ruins and the resulting fire burned for three days. Refugee camps sprang up in parks bordering one of the few neighborhoods left unscathed, the Western Edition. Row upon row of stately Victorians stood untouched by the devastation. Built to house one or two families, they were quickly subdivided into boarding houses for the new residents pouring into the neighborhood. 
What had once been a bedroom community was suddenly city center. Within days of the earthquake, City Hall, now in ruins, relocated to the closest thoroughfare left intact, Fillmore Street. The first streetcar to resume operation ran along Fillmore. Soon, San Francisco's finest shops were setting their sights on the bustling streets of the Western Edition. At the beginning, the Fillmore merchants that settled in there had visions of, of uh, Fillmore Street replacing Market Street as the main street. And for a few years, Fillmore was the main street of San Francisco. The merchants along Fillmore chipped in to build a set of 14 arches stretching more than a mile. On each corner, there's four arches covered from one side of the street to the other. And they're always lit up every single night, like white lights. The big lights were beaming all over the place. Just a beautiful sight. Fillmore Street would become the meeting ground for some 50,000 residents who found themselves drawn together into one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the country. The Fillmore in those years was about the closest to a large Jewish neighborhood that San Francisco ever had. We had three synagogues. We had a cluster of uh, Jewish restaurants. We had Jewish merchants. You knew the butcher. Your mother would go into the butcher shop and say, hello, uh, Dave, darling. 1043 Steiner, where uh, Yehudi Menachem's family lived. You could possibly hear either Yehudi practicing the violin, or you could hear Yalta or Hepzibah's sisters <laughs> practicing the piano. We had uh, different ethnic mixes, and that was reflected in the makeup of my school classes. And, and we didn't have any racial problems somehow. We had Irish, we had Russians, we had... Uh, White children, uh, Chinese children, Japanese children. You know, the colored population, we were, although we were small in number. I'm surprised to hear that there was a black community because, you know, we had very few in school. You could walk down Market Street at that time, and the only black face you'd see is looking in those plate glass windows and see your own reflection. Fewer than 1% of the city's residents were African Americans, but those who were migrated into the Western Edition alongside the Filipinos, the Jews, the Mexicans. Not that San Francisco was colorblind, far from it. Many minorities had a hard time finding any place to live, but in this neighborhood, for a long while, race didn't seem to matter much. East of Fillmore Street was a Japanese settlement. There must have been at least five, 6,000 Japanese Americans living within this area. You pass them on the street, they bow down to you, greet you. I was always taught that uh, when you met uh, a first generation, the older people, you would always bow. Konnichiwa. <laughs> Darius Morimoto spent her childhood on Fillmore Street. Her parents, both born in Japan, operated a dry cleaning store, and the family lived upstairs in a rented flat. The Morimoto family, four generations, has been in the same house on Fillmore Street since 1917, on the edge of what became known as Nihonmachi, Japan Town. My parents didn't want us to forget that we were Japanese, and so for us to learn Japanese custom, because, uh, American custom, you can pick it up. But Japanese custom, the real nitty-gritty, <laughs> you have to learn it from them. My father had this bookstore that sold nothing but Japanese books. Everybody gathered there and played cards or read books. We were always poor because nobody bought any books. They just stood there and read the books and went home. It was a kind of a isolated community, uh, we did have a barrier or there's this invisible wall that we always seem to stay within. We had our regular hot dog or hamburger shops and nothing was different other than American kids, but we were all Asian kids. It's a phenomenon how an ethnic community comes into a neighborhood and makes it all of a sudden a Nihonmachi, a J-town. You know, shoe store, candy store, drug store, churches and Girl Scouts and, you know, activities for the young Niseis in terms of sports. 
The environment for Asian Japanese Americans was not the most welcome, you know, uh, atmosphere for these folks, you know. It's amazing that within that, to me, is this so, such a strong desire to adopt this country. Because the bottom line is, America is good. How did you hear about it? What kind of notification did you get? You mean for us to move? Uh-huh, to relocate. That war had broken uh, out. I don't know. I don't remember any of that. <laughs> well, I think historically uh, what happened was they... I really don't. I put it, <laughs> I put it all in the back of me. Right. I didn't want to remember it. And that's, what, that's something you don't want to remember. War? No. It's a period where we would try to wash away from our memory. And that's the reason I don't recall too much of what really happened. I mean, not can recall, but, you know, I just didn't want to re remember, I guess. When Pearl Harbor hit, I can remember the, the uh, Japanese people. They, they, um, they really stuck close, and they were, you'd very seldom see them on the street and there was a lot of resentment. My husband and I had uh, a contract with the uh, San Francisco Presidio, and we were doing all the cleaning of the uniforms. The people going by, seeing all the uniforms brought in, taken out, they didn't like it. And they, we were called dirty Japs. Yeah. Hmm. I remember that so distinctly. Personally, I had um, a high regard for the Japanese community that existed uh, in the old Fillmore area because uh, they were industrious, they were clean, they were honorable, and if you did business with them, you didn't have to be afraid that you'd be misled. the awful feeling when they disappeared. It was as if it happened Thank you so much. Um, it's always a very, it, it, that, that segment of the, 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 the video is, is a hard watch. But uh, I'm glad and we're very honored to have two guests here who have deep connections to, to the film in San Francisco and who have very, very passionate stories to share. 
uh, with us today. So uh, I'll start off with uh, Chuck and then Mike, uh, uh, Mickey, sorry, if you could just speak to us about your experience in that neighborhood and um, share your story with us here. We have each, each of you have about five to seven minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank the Department of Public Works for this forum. Jamoki, uh, Patrick, um, Bayor, Beth and Clinton, all of you for our preparation. Um, so we've just watched a piece of a video, which is a longer essay on the Fillmore, the Western edition, J-Town. Um, I, I urge you to watch it. The poignancy of the video that Peter Stein produced probably 25 years ago could not be more clear today. That, that's the beauty of documentation. What documentation allows us to do is to understand the past. And understanding the past and, and, a, and an increasingly wider lens of what the past is, we can begin to reimagine a future. I, I was born in 1947. My parents owned a house at 2003 Pine Street. And they had been able to buy that house because the Japanese had left during the war. They, were, they didn't leave. This was forced removal. And so when we really use language carefully, we understand that removal is a great harm. It's the same sort of removal that, that caused millions of, of Black people to leave the South. They were removed. They didn't leave voluntarily. Neither did they go there voluntarily. But that notion of removal is really inherent in both stories of our Japanese community and our Black community. But right alongside the Japanese community was the Filipino community. And so we really look at you know, the, the Asian aspect of our identity and to realize that the community that I was born into in 1947 had gone through a war and Blacks had come from the South to really win the war. The great migration that happened in the 1940s brought my father and my mother from the East and the South to San Francisco. And they were a part of winning the war. Being born in 1947 was different than being born before then, because I'm sort of AD. You know, we inherited actually the, the resurgence, the, the re-entry of our Japanese families was extremely important to the identity of the community uh, because though they had been in all of these concentration camps, they came back with full vigor. And that was a, a, an important part of the reestablishment of the Nihon Machi, which was just two blocks away from us on Pine Street. So we grew up in a community that, as was described in this video, was replete with many ethnicities. I don't like to use the term race. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that out. And when I use race, it's because I'm weaponizing a term. But the ethnicities that were present gave us a very, very strong sense of a whole. But what happened? Why wasn't that whole encouraged? Why wasn't it nurtured? Why wasn't it developed? And therein lies the dilemma, the issues, and the history. Because the forced removal through redevelopment of the Japanese and the black communities was under color of law. It was under color of government. It was under color of a public and a set of policies. And we'll get to that later in this conversation that put in place the removal, as they said, of hundreds and hundreds of housing units and businesses and places where people found community. And so, you know, today is an opportunity for us to really reimagine the future by understanding and creating what I would call a usable history. We, I think we use history carefully. We have to examine history. We have to apply language, but we also out of that have to put and create a container for what we do about it. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about the harm and the trauma. That is, you look at that video, 
or read about the history of Jonestown or read about the history of incarceration and imprisonment uh, and forced removal of Japanese in, into those camps. Read that. Do not accept what you can see. Do it for your own. And you can begin to understand that where we are today in saying that the Department of Public Works says that it is an agency and it implements other ag agendas. But you know, it's the same way as saying that in Nazi Germany that it was okay for uh, good Germans to stand by while, while uh, 7 million Jews, gypsies, disabled people, et cetera, 10 or 12 were exterminated. So it's not okay to say that you are simply an agent. You must take responsibility of your agency. And that's really where we can begin in a conversation like this to think about how it is that we advance. Thank I you. think I've probably spent my five minutes. Th thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, you, you're very passionate about this and we'll hear more from you. Uh, uh, Mickey, over to you now. Can you also share your story? Thank you. Uh, First of all, I was really moved uh, by the documentary, and uh, you know, I, what, one of the things I've learned was that, uh, like I, after the earthquake, that the Western Edition uh, was such a multinational community. <clears throat> you know, had a large uh, amount, uh, number of Jewish people. Uh, you know, there were Filipinos and stuff, uh, but for me. <clears throat> Uh, unlike Chuck, who was born in the Western Edition or Japantown, um, I didn't come to San Francisco until 1971. And then, uh, and you know, my first job was uh, maybe I mentioned earlier was uh, to get a job in uh, San Francisco's Japantown and worked in a small shop. And my impressions uh, were for me. It was uh, an eye-opening uh, experience because as a Japanese uh, from Japan, grew up in New York, I had little knowledge. Uh, I, I didn't know that there were even like Japanese Americans or that there was even a Japanese community. So I found that when I first came here and I saw Japantown, I, I was really... Uh, uh, I mean, I felt like home, and a lot of that had to, to be you know, being able to eat Japanese food whenever I wanted and stuff. But it seemed like a community uh, community that I didn't know. And uh, when I came and got the job, uh, the redevelopment process in uh, the Western Edition and Japantown had already uh, started. And the A1 project uh, was the largest of the, re uh, the two projects for RDA. And uh, by the time I came, the Japan Trade Center had already been built, uh, which spanned from uh, Laguna all the way down to Fillmore Street. And previously, where there had been uh, hundreds of units of uh, housing and small shops, they were being replaced by uh, uh, the Japanese Trade Center. And this all came into being, it wasn't an accident that uh, this Trade Center, Cultural Center was built because it had to do with, uh, at that time, uh, there was a plan to, to uh, redevelop the whole community to bring in uh, large corporations that can promote tourism, uh, you know, and at St. Yeah, you know, tourism like building hotels, things like the Trade Center. The Trade Center had, uh, uh, you know, spaces in there. They were from corporate uh, large corporations from Japan, showrooms like uh, Sony and. Uh, dots and cars and stuff. But anyway, so I was learning this as I continued to work there. And uh, one of the things I noticed like, was that uh, it was a very uh, vibrant community, although it had shrunk so much in size. And uh, 
my recollections of the Fillmore and uh, the, the other parts of the West Indition, I wasn't that familiar with. Um, but I, as I got involved in uh, this group called King, Kami Against Nihomachi Evictions, uh, I began to learn more and more about the devastating effects that redevelopment had on the Black community as well as the Japanese community. Um, so I'm not sure where else to start, but I just know that uh, the group that I was involved in, um, we were we were an organization that was built. Uh, form because many uh, the tenants and small shopkeepers uh, didn't have uh, rights. I mean, basic rights. Uh, for example, around the redevelopment, they they uh, they were not landowners. Uh, they were renting or leasing their apartments. And when uh, the redevelopment agency decided to go to the uh, second project, which was A2, by that time, Japantown has shrunk into a four square block area. I mean, and, it, and even there, the agency continued to, uh, to go out with their uh, master plan. And in the A2 project for, for, for the small uh, four square block area, uh, they destroyed homes, apartments, and small shops. Um, and instead they built uh, uh, a hotel. Yeah. Which, uh, which was, um, well, it was, the, uh, it was called the Kyoto Inn, but they had all, this corporation from Japan called Kintetsu had already built a, a larger hotel uh, as part of the, the Japan Trade Center. So here we had two tourist hotels in the community. All these, uh, People had been forcibly evicted, and uh, there were fewer and fewer shops. And uh, and then also the same corporation uh, wanted to build a 40-lane bowling alley right on the corner of uh, Post and uh, Webster. So here we had all these things, and we were, we were an organization that was trying to support the tenants who were, were just trying to get basic uh rights i mean things i mean even i mean basic yeah. things like the redevelopment agency you know uh uh, yeah. uh letting people know you know what was uh what what was the, what their plans were uh yeah. and m many times when they came to like say serve eviction notices it was not in a very i mean it was somewhat hostile very intimidating and the other thing was uh, there were many, still many people in the community who didn't, you know, uh, know English that well, and then there was uh, no, you know, translations to uh, at these uh, yeah. expectations. Yeah. So that's what we're basically fighting on. And uh, one of the things I learned, I don't know if people have heard about the San Francisco Barrier Master Plan. But the master plan was designed by large corporations. It was the Bay Area Council that included, you know, large corporations like Chevron, uh, others. And uh, in the late so, 50s, early 60s, they came up with a plan, a uh, master plan, which was to make San Francisco the uh, the, the financial so, center. Nikki, I, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but that's yeah, part of next okay. set of questions okay. so anyway I'm so trying, i'm trying not to uh, for us not to, to, okay. to so, get ahead so of that but that time? question is coming um okay. yeah so if pa patrick the next set of questions pa patrick you have the others do you have the next set of questions before we move into the redevelopment um that mickey was talking about right yeah um thank you both um chuck sort of touched on it um no we really don't want to um, we, we can watch the, the film uh, for the, the history of redevelopment, but what we want to try to focus on is, you know, how, do, how can we reimagine the future, given what we, given our history, 
um, what are some equitable pathways forward, how we can reimagine the future. Um, I know, Chuck, you had mentioned um, about how agencies need to take responsibility. Um, you know, the the these forced removals were government policies. Um, again, so learning from our history, you know, how 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 can we move forward from that so as not to to repeat history? So you know, Mickey said something that uh, that really inspired a lot of thought, and, and that is, you know, where does the responsibility lie? Um, how, how do you have a set of actionable principles that you can point to? One of the one of the great advantages that we have is that we, in theory, live in what we call a progressive political environment. Every one of our departments has a racial equity plan. We have racial equity officers. We have databases that we keep. Um, I sit as a as an arts commissioner. I'm president of the San Francisco Arts Commission, and in fact, we were the first of the agencies to develop our racial equity plan. And we hold ourselves accountable to it by looking at data. But the data doesn't mean much if it's not asking or probing the right questions. So it's very important. I, and I'm not going to describe that because you can read all of those racial equity you know, formula you know, throughout the city and county of San Francisco. But you, you have to hold yourself accountable to certain principles. And it is in that that you have the ability to enforce your agency as a person in the department. You know, it, it is not okay to say that we just do other people's projects. That's just like saying, I'm just the same person who's going to throw the gas in the incinerator and kill the people, you know, in Dachau. You're an agent of something. And, and, and it doesn't mean that this is about guilt, but it's about understanding that from the policies that do exist, what do you do about that in hiring and subcontractable, uh, you know, uh, elements of, of plans, you know, so that you can really look at the economic, you know, flow. The University of California spends $4.5 billion a year, and it has something called the Anchor Initiative. And the Anchor Initiative explores and then puts in place how it spends that $4.5 billion a year. And it holds itself accountable in many different frameworks. That's really the type of thing that you look at and say, okay, what's our spend? Who is, who is getting the money? How is that working? And how do we then you know, create you know, an economic future for people and, and communities that have been so deeply harmed by this? But one of the things that Nikki said was that people did not have standing that didn't own property, as if a leasehold is not a property interest. But if you were a tenant, you didn't have the same rights or you have very few rights, you know, to enforce. And so, you know, those are that's the architecture of the past. But I think that the architecture of the future is one to say, you know, to your commission, to your leaders and to yourselves, you know, what is our responsibility in this and to decenter the power dynamics. Again, you cannot be punished for being brave. You cannot be punished and should not be punished for speaking in civil ways about the very things that we allegedly stand for. And so from your own sense of why are there 69 people on this call? What does each one of you or each one of us have in our own um, capacity to do something? And I would hope that I would have an opportunity with Mickey and to sit down with you in three months, six months, nine months in a year and examine what you decided to do and put in place as a re as a product of this conversation. Because I didn't decide to spend five hours of preparation or an hour with you for this to just be, oh, you saw Chuck Collins and Mickey Moore talk. But I'd like to sit with you, and I would I would welcome the invitation to sit with you to see what you decide to do it. This is the same thing about talking, and I'm going to go to race, about trying to figure out white people's problems. White people have to understand what whiteness is and to decenter that from their humanity and really to go forward with that. So I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you what to do, but I will sit with you 
in the in the solution room. Thanks, Chuck. Mickey, you want to add? No, I mean, hey, hey, I, I, I would hope that this program today is not just the end uh, of it. That, uh, like Chuck says, I would like to see what the staff or what uh, this group uh, comes, you know, learns or comes out of this uh, meeting. So that'd be really great. Um, I don't really have uh anything else right now <laughs> all right i'm i'm going to open it up to um to the attendees uh, to either put your questions in the chat and we'll we'll read them um or your comments um or i don't know if if folks can uh open their mic unmute their mic and and um speak I'm, um, while we're waiting for folks to either um, unmute or write in the chat, I'm I'm curious with, you know, given the changing times from back then to now with, you know, the community activism, there's a, a lot of coalescing of different types of communities uh, within San Francisco. Um, if you feel that you know that is i guess a check and checks and balances way of making sure that uh government is is doing the right thing or you know a, a way for folks to to speak up i know a lot of the the agencies and departments us just recently we have we have a commission where um there's public comment and so um i'm i'm not sure if we had that back then where folks can speak up it, it didn't sound like it if uh, the only way you had community standing is if you own property. Um, so I, you know, maybe what's your your thoughts on that? Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that question, but I am going to I'm going to do what a good politician does, and that's answer the question that I want to talk about. Right? <laughs> Go for it. On, on Saturday, I was at the Southeast facility um, for an amazing celebration during Black History Month. It started at the Bayview Hopper House and ended out, you know, on Evans at the new Southeast facility. I've lived long enough to realize we don't have a Southeast facility in the Western edition. We have a very broken community from a Black perspective, and one that I'm not sure will ever uh, be repaired. But if you go and you look forward and you look at all of the lenses and all of the equity that was pointed at the new Southeast facility, you can begin to see the outline of the community that we want. You can see the outline of a blessed community in actions such as that, where it's a very, very different story than looking at the Fillmore Center or looking at the detritus that is allowed to exist in the Western edition and the social harm that is done every day. I, I would hope that we are springing from a new well in, in the Bayview Hunters Point in District 10 learning from this past and learning that government can do good. Government can produce resources that really accrue to the benefit of the community. The Southeast facility is not just an administrative headquarters. It is a community center. Are there more opportunities like this? Are there other ways in which you can work in order to have a blooming of things like this, and even perhaps to reimagine what could happen in the Western edition, you know, under the authorities that we have in the will of the community. Because I can tell you that it, it never felt good when we had that, that bridge that was kind of destroyed between J-Town and the Fillmore, that the city is allowed to look like a, something that shouldn't even be in America. So, you know, the harm is sitting there right in front of us right now. And we have to we have to put our eyes on it and say, what are we going to do about it? Hey, you know, you know uh, Chuck, um, well, you mentioned the, the bridge over Geary Boulevard, and that is a, a tra tragic symbol of how the whole re uh, redevelopment agency plans uh, develop to divide the Japanese community and the, the black community. And um, 
looking at the present and in the future, my hope is that the two communities can come together, you know, in a united way to develop an idea or concept for not only Japantown, but the entire film world, you know. I know that there have been attempts to revive the old, you know, the old Harlem of the West, you know, back in the old days. And now I see a couple of business on film or, you know, like a jazz club. But, you know, I like to see more of that, but it takes uh, people I, with money, I guess, uh, but also the help from the city to fund projects that benefit the people in the community. Like in Japantown, there isn't much of Japantown left. There are institutions that for the future uh, are able to provide different services to the community. So we have institutions, but as far as like the number of residents, small shopkeepers, it's gotten really, really small. And for Japantown, the next big project, and this is where the public works department comes in, there's a, it's still, the city, I believe, has a plan for the Japan Trade Center, the, the, from Laguna to Fillmore Street. Uh, the, the Trade Center is in need of a lot of uh, repair, especially the garage. But right now, most of that, the trade center is owned by 3D Corporation. And they have, you know, they're not very transparent as to uh, talking with the community about their plans. But along with other things to be developed in the, in the Fillmore district, and this project with the trace, the future, uh, uh, the, uh, the trace center, I think if people can just get together, you know, uh, between the two communities, there, there would be a powerful, uh, it would be a powerful force. And from my experience, just working in Kane, when we used to go to the Board of Permit Appeals uh, hearings or the redevelopment agent uh, hearings, if we weren't the landowners, I mean, we were just ordinary working people who are trying to preserve a commu uh, community, keep the residents there as long as possible. The only effective way that we found was like to, to do a lot of publicity, education about an issue, try to mobilize as many people, what we call mass pressure to put on the on whatever agency that we're, you know, we're dealing with in, you know, with uh, the city hall, so. But one thing that, that sprung out of, of that conversation is everything is not infrastructure. There's also the human side of all of this, about education, about healthcare, about decent work, about the climate, about the environment. All of these things really are what makes a community. Now, DPW takes a lot of responsibility for infrastructure, but you know, to um, not hinge those strategies around the people part of what's going on. I was in real estate development for years. You know, projects that we did, you've probably all been in. And and I and I left that business because I thought that I could help to heal the very community that I had come from by dint of doing better projects. And what I realized, you know, for the next 20 years of my life is that I would work in human development. I would work where children are prepared to hold the reins to become the Mickey Amores or the Patrick Rivera's or the, or the Jamokis or whoever it is. I worked, I worked on human subjects as agents of change because humans actually make almost everything happen for good or for not. And so I think that it's important to think about what Mickey was saying, what is the holistic strategy such that you're not working in isolation? Because that can often uh, frustrate, you know, okay, I'm just, I've just got these tools, but I need more tools in my box. The other thing that I saw on the chat channel, you took the bait, is what is the bridge? 
the bridge is um, going from from Geary across Geary Boulevard. So kind of at the other side is Post, and then the other side, you know, is is going to be Fillmore. Um, on Fillmore Street is going to be the Fillmore. But along there is a transit corridor. And we thought that that transit corridor was really important because it bridges the community. And so we commissioned one of the most important artists in the world, Mildred Howard, who if you go to the Southeast facility, there is a one point something million dollar sculpture that is sitting there that DPW helped to happen. That Mildred Love was the same artist. And if you go and look at that today, it is, it is destroyed. It has not been cared for. And it really is emblematic of the lack of compassion, the lack of concern, the lack of visibility, or the lack of understanding history, that a great artist's work is sitting there desecrated for all of us to see. And that's emblematic of public action. That's not sitting there just because you know it's sitting there. The public has responsibility for it. That 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 needs to that needs to be fixed. Can I say something? Uh, just in terms of the Western addition today, you know, there is still a remaining Black community, few Japanese, but I don't want to uh, forget uh, mentioning the increase in the Korean community that has moved into you know along the Fillmore. So I think that's important also. Now, as far as the the public works, back in the Kane days. You know, we used to go to hearings and stuff. And then I know that the public works uh, department would come to uh, buildings in Japantown that were uh, not being kept up to, you know, uh, kept in shape. And uh, I think when Chuck says about the human side, when, like, let's say the staff, for example, has a, an order to inspect the building, let's say 1531 Sutter Street, and you go and inspect the building and you know you make a choice it's not uh it's not repairable it needs to be demolished or this could the structure of sound it could be rehab right i think you have to look at well, where is this eviction you know this note uh this order to demolish or thing coming from and you know you have to look at when you say the human side, like this particular building, it had been owned by a member of the Japanese community who was a member of the, uh, the landowners uh, development corporation. And he let these let the building just deteriorate over and over again. And, you know, he's finally sued by the city to, you know, uh, to do repairs or sell the building. And then the redevelopment agency bought the building. And then they were dealing with uh, I guess the public works department the board of permit appeals and things like that. But, you know, there's, there's something behind like an eviction order or uh, an order to demolish a building. It seems to me that, uh, you know, who is behind wanting to do, you know, things like demolish a building. So. So we have a couple of seconds left, and I want to kind of go back and, and reiterate. Um, you know, Mickey and I are going to welcome a conversation with you in three, six, nine, and 12 months. Um, otherwise, I think this is just an exercise in having a nice lunch conversation. But you know, I'm a person who likes for rhetoric to lead to action. We can't describe the solutions, or even the conversations, or even the questions uh, that you might have. But I, I hope that you accept this as a, a really genuine invitation, you know, to allow us to come and sit with you and to see how it is that you're holding yourselves accountable, you know, to uh, what you what you glean from a conversation like this. Patrick, I, I see that um, Allison Nichols has her hand up. And I, and I, and I also that uh, Julian has a question in the chat. Hi, my name is Allison, born and raised in San Francisco. My parents um, migrated from Louisiana to the Fillmore to the Bayview. Um, I've been working for Public Works for the last 23 plus years. And my mom, 91, still alive, 90. I don't want to push her over, but yeah. <laughs> so um, to your point, what I, what, I, what I zoomed in on, everything you guys are saying is 
absolutely point on. We are, you know, we're we're at an impasse where we don't know how to move forward or what to do. But this conversation is great. And I believe if we incorporated the schools, the children, high schools, middle schools, even kindergartners and college and have this conversation on a larger scale where this could possibly be something that people can get credit from in college, mm -hmm. because I know when Ed Lee was a director, he made sure that any um, efforts for the clean team events you got credit for in college. And this would be like absolutely mm -hmm. along the humanitarian, you know, like the history is just rich. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. So I think once we follow up and do our due diligence and everybody reaches out and does their part, you know, if they can't play a part, at least they can refer their children, grandchildren, for me, my great grandchild, get in there, draw a picture, show us what you'd like to have happen. And how can we fix this long elated problem that seems to be festering under the surface, because it's the next generation that's going to make the difference. And the better we educate them, the, the, the better we can move forward with this, you know, on all levels, straight through the Bay Area. Okay. Yeah, Allison, that's why I went from hardware to software. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. I know we're coming up on time. We only have a couple of minutes. I, I do want to respect Julie's uh, question in the chat, so I'll read it. Maybe that'll be uh, the impetus for our, our, our follow-up meeting. And again, I want to thank uh, Chuck and, and Mickey for, for joining and sharing their experience. Can I just say something? Yes. Um, for anyone who's interested, this coming August 19th, uh, from two o'clock in the afternoon at the Japanese Community Center at 1858 Sutter, we're having a Kane 50th anniversary uh, event. And we're hoping like, uh, you know, uh, every, a lot of people who are still left in the community who were active back in the day, you know, will come but I just wanted to extend an invitation to anyone who's interested to also come out. It's a, it's a free event, donations only. All right. And then I, I will just, I'll just read Julie's um, question here and then um, folks, you know, can, can move on to their next meetings, but, you know, maybe it, this will be a start for our follow-up meeting um, in three, six or nine, nine months. Uh, Julie said, states, um, our question is, some of this honest history is very hard to face for some folks. Do you have any advice on how we can face our own on, honest history, learn from it, and encourage each other to do the same? You know, one of the most fundamental questions about America today. So, I, you know, there's no quick fix to the question that you've asked. But don't, but have courage. You know, find bravery and find also find allies. We are, none of us are in this alone and none of us are gonna get there by ourselves. And I strongly believe in allyhood, you know, like, you know, whether it's Steve or Mickey or Chuck or whatever it is, you know, we've never allowed ourselves, never have allowed ourselves to be separated, never. And that's one of the reasons why we are the survivors because we won't, we won't allow that to happen. So find your allies. And and lean into that. I, I guess I would respond to that question by giving an example of uh, for Japanese Americans, the third generation, when they were uh, with ethnic studies, they were learning about the history, you know, of uh, our people and stuff. Of course, one of the most you know things that came out was the experience of the second and first generation Japanese in the concentration camps. Now, following the war, when they left the camps and returned to the communities, it was very hard for many, most uh, Nisei and Issei, the first and second generation, to, to share with their kids, the third generation, what they had experienced in the camps. There was a lot of stigma that was attached, uh, and Japanese people being very shy in ways and internalizing many things. It was very hard for them to speak. But with, I think the, the third generation, when they learn more and more from uh, studies, they pursued their conversation with their elders. 
And then as more uh, elders got interested and opened up, it, it's like a big wave where by 1980s or se late 70s, there were so many Issei and Nisei who stood up, demanded reparation, redress and reparations. And I mean, for us, that was like a great achievement, being able to have uh, parents and grandparents open up and share, you know, what they had experienced. And I mean, that was a, a tremendous uh, weapon that brought all generations of Japanese Americans together. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Chuck. Um, this was a great, great discussion. And, you know, my, I'm grateful to, to, to be part of, part of this discussion and a continuation of it um, moving down the line. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I encourage everyone to please watch that film. It's, it's a little hard uh, in terms of emotions, but it's, it's important information uh, for us to learn. And this is part of bridging the gap and healing and reuniting communities as well. So thank you. Thank you, Chalk. Thank you, Mickey. It's a great session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.